just a bit about us. Our mission is to reverse the current downward trend in the study of the ancient world by engaging the public and bringing together students and scholars to share their passion for the study of the ancient world in order to inspire a vast new generation of students. Uh, if you want to follow us online, we have Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Twitch, YouTube, and TikTok, all the hip young socials. Uh, our live event protocol, just briefly, we do ask that you be kind and respectful. Listen and ask thoughtful questions throughout the event as they come to mind. Be patient with technology and those administering it. Uh, our live events are live streamed as said on Twitch, YouTube, and Facebook. They are all recorded and archived as well. Recordings will be posted on the above platform shortly after the event. And lastly, just have fun. If you enjoy our live events, we have archaeo gaming, book clubs, reading groups, in addition to our Port Ancient series, please consider becoming a sponsor with a monthly donation. Uh, for as little as $3 a month, you can help save ancient studies too. And thank you for joining us. I'll now stop my screen share and Katie, feel free to take over from here and tell us a bit about yourself. Oh, Katie, you're muted. I think you're muted, yeah. Thank you so much. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and pull up my slide deck. I've got a, a brief, uh, slide deck here. First of all, thank you so much, Sasa, for having this opportunity for me to come and chat with you. Um, Sandra, I'm really excited to chat with you um, about what Mesoamerican Studies Online has been doing and what we're looking to do in the future. Um, as you mentioned, uh, Mesoamerican Studies Online is an online portal for learning more about the ancient Mesoamerican world. Um, I am Catherine or Katie Knuckles Wild. Uh, I'm currently a PhD candidate in Art History and Latin American study, Studies at Tulane University in New Orleans. Um, I specialize in classic Maya art and writing. And so I work a little bit in the art and a little bit in the hieroglyphs and it's the best of every possible world that I could have ever imagined for myself. Um, I have a master's degree in art history from University of Texas at Austin and a bachelor's degree in Latin American studies. So my PhD program right now is absolutely perfect for me. Um, and I obviously um, am the founder of Mesoamerican Studies Online, which I affectionately call Meso um, to not use the mouthful. So Meso's purpose is to disseminate knowledge of ancient Mesoamerica and recent research to the general public via blog posts, a podcast, and online courses. Um, and I've kind of dedicated different amounts of energy to each one of these different pursuits throughout the three years, um, almost four years now that Meso has been in existence. Um, really, for me, this project came about to fulfill a need that, that I felt for myself. I remember when I, when I was applying to grad schools and I was really curious about learning more and learning as much as I could about Mesoamerica before I started my, my grad degree. I was trying to find a podcast that I could listen to on the bus on my way to campus. Um, and there was nothing. There was like, a, there, there was like one 10 hour recording turned into a podcast but it was a recording of a presentation without the slides attached and so it was it was really great but I was like there's got to be a podcast on this topic somewhere and there wasn't and so I went ahead and decided to start one um, since then a couple others have started um, I'm going to start linking to them on my website and I'm really excited about them there's some in uh, Spanish and in English and my podcast is bilingual as well um, and so what my podcast does in particular is it puts pulls academics into the general public sphere. So I interview different researchers on the work that they've been doing in the field so that they can talk to the general public instead of having to go through uh, journal articles and rely on the, the public being able to access those articles because it's really impossible with a lot of the paywalls that are in place. Um, and so the podcast does generally have some thematic episodes where it's just me and a friend um, sharing information. Sometimes it's just me. Um, and so I, I want my, my main goal in starting Mesoamerican Studies Online was to provide more accessible information to the public, um, mainly through the podcast and blog posts. But I have also started doing online courses as well. So 
in the years that Method has been in existence, I've, I've done a lot of different work on different things. Um, initially was the, uh, the idea, when I very first started this, I thought that the only people who would possibly be interested in learning about Mesoamerica were people who were going on trips, so tourists. Um, and, you know, I, I originally catered my first online courses to tourists. And uh, there was a little bit of success there, but what, what those first months taught me was that people in general are just curious about the ancient world. And so I started just uh, moving my courses more into the realm of teaching people general knowledge about the ancient world. So my most popular course that I've been focusing on for the past year or so has been a live online course on Maya hieroglyphic writing. So I read and write Maya hieroglyphs and so I teach occasionally a foundational level and an intermediate level for people who want to learn more about reading and writing Maya hieroglyphs. Um, these are usually six week courses that sort of build incrementally in knowledge. Um, and I, I, I also, as I mentioned, had the podcast going at the same time. Um, the podcast has been a lot of fun. Um, it's, it's sort of taken a backseat as I was working through my exams. Um, but now that I've got a little bit more time, I'm working on, um, on the podcast a little bit more, which is really exciting for me. It's one of my favorite parts about Meso. Um, and also the blog, which I've screenshot here um and there's you know this is the the website and the blog at mesoamericanstudiesonline.com or dot blog um where you can find different blog posts that i've written and that colleagues have written about the ancient maya and mesoamerican worlds um, and basically it's the hub where you can figure out what all is happening and then, of course, a lot of my projects have been in collaboration with Sasa. Um, Sasa and I found each other through Instagram, of all places, um, and it's just been one of the most productive collaborations that I've had in my career, and I absolutely love working with Sasa. Um, I've led different reading groups on Maya hieroglyphic writing. We've also done one on Maya myths in art and writing. Um, and we even last year had a soap carving workshop where we uh, learned how to carve uh, Maya hieroglyphs into bars of soap, uh, which was just so much fun. I brought in two of my colleagues for that, and it was just a great time. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to do it again sometime in the future. Um, but so being able to, to work alongside Sasa with our, our dual and parallel missions has been a lot of fun. Um, so that brings me to, to current and upcoming projects. I'm currently in the process now of getting more interviews to publish more podcast episodes. Um, I have two friends in particular who have really fascinating work going on and um, we're, we're scheduling the interviews right now. They both had field research to do over the summer. So um, we're putting together more interviews. I'm trying to uh, search out a, a co-host that can come with me to, so that we can have a little bit more of a dynamic uh, dynamic content for those thematic episodes that aren't interview-based. Um, I'm currently uh, getting ready to go into the field to do research for my dissertation. And so for me, my mind is going to be very closely connected to the Maya over the next year. So I'm probably going to be leaning more into the Maya content. And then I'm also looking for guest authors who are interested in guest authoring blog posts on other regions of Mesoamerica um, so that we can get this, this really rich dynamic content that focuses on the entire region rather than just the more famous parts of the region. And then finally, I'm going to be putting up uh, some evergreen at your own pace Maya glyph courses online. Um, and because I'll be in the field, I won't be able to be teaching these courses in person the way that I have been for the past year. And so I'm trying to get some online courses that people can subscribe to and work through on their own um, while I'm in the field. Um, so these are just some of the things that, that I've been working on with Mesoamerican Studies Online. Um, I would absolutely love to chat more with you, Cassandra, and just talk a little bit more about, uh, about the project and different things that I've been working on. Um, and I, I know that this is being live streamed, so if there are any questions as well, I'm super happy to answer any of those. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to kind of give you a general idea of what it is that I've been working on and what the project itself is and has as its mission. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you for sharing that. Um, when I was looking through uh, the Mesoamerica Studies Online website last night, I was like wicked impressed. I'm sorry, I'm from New England, so <laughs> you might hear me say wicked quite a bit. Um, but I was really, very impressed uh, with how much you do, especially the uh, 
language courses, because uh, I know that's something that a lot of people who want to study the ancient world struggle with, especially with the Americas. Uh, and yeah, I guess my question would be, how did you get started studying the ancient Americas in particular? I know a lot of the time the narrative is, you know, it starts with Columbus. And after a lot of us, at least in the States, we don't learn a lot about the ancient Americas. Yeah, yeah. So for me, it, you know, the, the journey that I took was really affected by the way that my dad's work uh, kind of moved. My dad is, is self-employed. Um, and sorry, I've got a sick baby in the room next door. So I'm hoping that, you know, it's not too loud. But um, I, uh, you know, when my dad is self-employed. And so as I was growing up, we lived in Mexico off and on. Um, and so I spent a lot of time in Mexico and got to see a lot of aspects of the ancient culture that are still really prominent in modern Mexican culture. And um, for me, it was just fascinating. You know, I, um, I grew up in the country in Mexico um, and spent time there off and on. Um, and so it, it was something that was always present and it was always really curious to me. Um, I also, because I grew up in Mexico as a child, I grew up bilingual. And so language to me was always something that was really interesting. Um, I, I remember when I was like six or seven years old, I made up my own language, which of course was just English pronounced backwards. So, you know, it, it wasn't anything revolutionary by any means, but it was sort of the beginning of this, uh, this, this lifelong love for language and for other cultures. And so for me, it started really in that, um, that love of the ancient world through the lens, obviously of a modern culture. Um, and then as I went to undergrad, I went through the process that I think a lot of us do where I chose a career that would be profitable. Um, and so I went into uh, ESL teaching. I was going to teach English as a second language. Um, but then every elective chance I got, I found myself taking these ancient culture classes. Um, and it wasn't until my senior year in high school or in undergrad that I uh, went to a presentation by a Spanish professor that just like really, I don't know, it just like, it made me realize that I could do something that would be a productive career, or I could do something that I was really passionate about, something that absorbed my mind whenever I wasn't doing those things. Um, and that for me was the, it was the clicking point and the tipping point. And I've just been underwater in Mesoamerica ever since. Um, and I have a relatively profitable career. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm still very, very um, much living the student lifestyle. So there's not a lot of income. My husband is also a student, so still not a lot of income. But, but I, I just, you know, for me, it's the satisfaction of every day knowing that I've done something that I've passion that I'm passionate about, um, that just makes it just so incredibly satisfying. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's something that all of us who work in some way in the, um, in history can understand. Mm -hmm. yeah, I I don't work in history. I work in an entirely different field, but I am getting my master's currently in ancient history. And yeah, just looking, do I go profitable or do I go with my passion uh, is a hard choice to make. So it's I think it's admirable that you've done that. Um, what has been, I guess, some of your mo most rewarding projects that you've worked on? You know, for me, I think the the two most rewarding projects have been the Glyph course and the podcast. Um, the blog posts are really fun. I really enjoy putting those together. Um, but I really love the collaborative nature of both the podcast and the Glyph courses. Um, the podcast lets me, you know, just kind of sit with friends and colleagues and talk about their work for a long time, which is just really satisfying to me. And, and I love hearing the response from people who listen to the podcast um, and, and have great feedback. I have, you know, I remember I've had a couple interviews with, with friends where I post the interview on the podcast and someone will email me and say, hey, I just wanted to tell so-and-so who was your guest on the podcast that they're incredible and I would love to like hear more about their work. And so just being able to connect people um, has been really rewarding to me and being able to, to sort of uh, grow this network of people interested in the ancient world, both within the, the professional and the public spheres. Um, and then the, the glyph courses in particular have been 
Um, you know, it's, it's something that I, I always wanted. I taught myself to read glyphs when I was an undergrad because there wasn't a course that would teach it. And so, you know, I, the glyph courses are something that I would have loved to do when I was an undergrad and trying to learn these things on my own. And I've had so many students come to this course who have told me, you know, I've been trying to teach myself forever and I just needed a course and I found yours and it was so great. And, you know, mine isn't the only course. There are other courses available um, now that weren't available, you know, even five, six years ago. Um, and it just, it brings me a lot of satisfaction to know that, that, those courses are part of a growing community where this knowledge is much more freely available, um, which, you know, in, in a sort of niche tangential way ties into the history of Maya hieroglyphic writing, because um, when we were first trying to decipher the glyphs, and I say we, it's like, like the collective we, I was barely like alive when all of this was happening. But um, one of the great Mayanist scholars, Linda Sheely, was well known for hosting glyph workshops at the University of Texas at Austin um, that were open to the public and collaborative with the public. And so the general public would participate in these workshops and contribute insights to scholarly knowledge. And I, I like the feeling that these courses, even though they're not the same groups that were hosted in Austin and are nowhere near the magnitude. Um, I enjoy the the thought that that the glyph courses that I that I get to lead sort of continue in that tradition of the the public and the academic spheres colliding and co-creating knowledge. Yeah, and that's that's so important, especially if we're looking at the ancient world. I think and going beyond what I call the big three, you know, Greek, Rome, Egypt. If we're going beyond that, a lot of the resources just aren't there or they're just starting to grow like, like we're seeing in Mesoamericas. Um, I guess, what would you suggest to someone who wanted to start out like researching this field or getting more involved? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and you know, Mesoamerican studies is sort of continuing in the steps of those big three where you can go into the field, but there's different areas of the field that you can go into. Um, and so, for example, in Egyptology, you know, you, you could be a linguist, you could be an art historian, you could be an archaeologist. Um, there's so many different ways to approach the field. Um, and so the best advice that I would give would be to figure out what you would want your main focus to be um, and to start looking at inroads once you determine that main focus. Um, your focus might change as you dive in, um, but I think that especially with fields like these that tend to create an amalgamation or, a, or a, you know, they become a melting pot for different disciplines. It's important to know where you want your inroads to be, at least to get started, because you have to, you have to know where you want to start in order to get to where you're going. Um, so for me, you know, it started out with archaeology. I thought that I had to be an archaeologist. Um, and uh, so, you know, I, I bought a whole bunch of intro books to archaeology. I started learning. I, you know, I, I took one course in undergrad, but it wasn't a methods course. So I started learning a lot more about archaeology. Um, and the more I learned about archaeology, the more I realized that there were parts about it that I loved, but also parts about it that I didn't think would be fulfilling for me. Um, and so I started looking more into linguistics and art history, which is more, you know, related to the art history in particular, related to the visual aspects of things. And that's where I really found my happy place is that, you know, I realized that with art history, there's also a lot of things that are not satisfying about the field um, to many archeologists and anthropologists and linguists. And I know this because I have friends in all of these disciplines, but um, for me, art history was great because it allowed me to choose what objects I wanted to work with. I had a little bit more control over how the project would go. Um, and uh, so I, I think my best advice would be to figure out what angle you wanna to go to if you're looking to get into a professional sphere. Um, now, if you're looking for sort of, you know, if you're someone who's coming in from the non-academic world and this is a hobby or a pastime for you, um, even an incredibly passionate pastime, um, you know, the best resources I would recommend nowadays, I would say try to find some of the professional um, professional groups and clubs um, that have frequent, um, what are they called? Um, well, they all call them something different, frequent presentations by scholars. Um, so like the podcast invites uh, 
scholars to share their work via podcast. There are also different organizations that will have um, monthly or biannual presentations or conferences online. And now everything's available online. So it makes it a lot easier. Um, there's also a lot of free websites online uh, for Mesoamerican topics. Uh, one of them is FAMSI, the Foundation for the Advancement of Mesoamerican Studies, Incorporated. Um, it's a free website that has a lot of images of Maya monuments, a lot of collections of the early research that was done. Um, and then um, obviously Mesoamerican Studies Online has a lot of free resources. And I do have an online resources tab on the website that links people to other websites. Um, and then there's also a lot of really good books. You know, a, a lot of these uh, these big scholars in the Mesoamericanist world have published books that are relatively affordable. Um, books by Thames and Hudson give a really great introduction to these ancient so, ancient excuse me ancient societies, um, and they're relatively affordable, between fifteen twenty dollars a piece. Um, and yeah, I, I think those are those are the, the main entry points, depending on if you want to go into uh, a professional career in this, or if it's something that you're passionate about um, as an escape from the everyday, which I think we all do need also. Um, and so, yeah, I think those are the, the best avenues. You know, I, I also, you know, I, I work with uh, two, now it's going to be three people um, who are working professionals. They work in, you know, one works in film, another works in IT, the other one is, you know, just, it's still like working through their schooling. Um, but they're all passionate about Mesoamerican studies, particularly the Maya. And so I tutor them once a week in how to read Maya hieroglyphic writing. And so, um, you know, these, these are also people who are passionate about it, but have a life built that doesn't include it. And because of their current situation, they can't go back and get a career um, in this topic. And so, you know, there, there's a lot of resources. Um, I, I would say, you know, look look at some of these free pages online, um, some, some of which I list on the website, um, because there's, there's a lot out there, but I know from personal experience that it's hard to find what's out there, so. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, thanks to groups like SASA, people like yourself and our other Port Ancient partners, you know, we're making great strides in making things like this more accessible, uh, which is wonderful. Uh, we are about up for time with our stream, but if you have anything else you want to share or if you want to plug your website one more time, anything like that, feel free. Yeah, I mean, First of all, just thank you again for sitting down and chatting with me. Um, I don't have anything else really that I think I want to add. The you know the the website MesoamericanStudiesOnline.com or .blog both will get you to the same page. Um, but yeah, other than that, I just really have enjoyed talking with you, and I have always enjoyed working with the SASA community, and look forward to uh, look forward to doing it more in the future. All right, awesome. Well, thank you so much, and thank you everyone who's joined us. And yeah, we'll and the live stream now. Thank you so much.